Hey everybody. Um, hopefully you can uh, you can hear me okay. Uh, yes. Oh no no we're okay. Trust me. I'm I'm a professional. Um, so look, uh, uh, sadly uh, I don't have any any code to show you, which honestly like makes me cry a little bit on the inside. Um, there's nothing more. Nothing I like more than, than live coding, but I do have an interesting talk that I hope you're all going to like. Um, but I want to start it off with a magic trick. Um, and uh, I actually need your participation. I need everybody here to pull out their mobile phone. And uh, presumably, if you're using something other than a Motorola Razor, uh, there will be a calculator application on your mobile phone. Um, so just go ahead and pull that out. And all we're going to do is I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions that are going to generate unique numbers for you. And, I and we're going to add those numbers together on the calculator. And I'm going to participate, right? So I'm going I'm to kind of come along with you on this journey. So the first thing that I want you to do is think of a very important moment in your life. Um, it can be any kind of moment, but something that is incredibly and deeply meaningful for you. Um, for me, I became a father in 2010 when my daughter Catherine was born. So I am going to type in 2010 and hit plus. So just go ahead and type in that year and hit plus. The next thing I want you to type in is uh, your age. Um, uh, either your age, if your birthday was in the past, or in the, you know, this, this year, yeah, sorry. If your, birth, if your birthday was earlier this year, it's however old you are. If your birthday is going to be before the end of the year, it's however old you're going to be before the end of the year. So go ahead and type that in and press plus. Uh, now I want you to type in the integer value of the current month. So October is 10, November is 11. Type in the integer value for December and hit plus. Uh, now, uh, whatever the number of your mobile phone is, I want you to think of the last four digits of that number, and I want you to enter it in. I have to kind of think it, think it through, but okay, uh, uh, yes, and then hit plus. Uh, now, uh, this is easy, the year you were born. Um, I was born a really long time ago, I'm not going to say it out loud, um, and hit plus. And lastly, uh, that really meaningful event in your life, um, whatever year it took place, um, just think how many years it's been since that really important moment, and type it in and hit plus. So I've got a number. Um, hopefully you all have numbers. Um, I would wager that they are all unique. Uh, and now I would like you to simply compose a text message to the number that you see on the screen. I'll go ahead and read it out. It's 979-589-5555. Uh, and ask the question, the very pertinent question, what is my number? And uh, I will go ahead and play along myself. What is my number? OK, cool. And hit send. Now, uh, hopefully, if everything's working, uh, you'll get a response back. And uh, you know, compare that response to the number that's in your calculator. Okay. Now look, if you know how this trick works, um, keep it to yourself you know, for at least the next 20 minutes. Um, but if you don't know how it works, um, you know, how do you feel right now? Do you feel surprised? Do you feel a little bit of, are you astonished? You know, do you have, do you have, do you have a feeling of wonder? Um, well, I want you to hold on to those feelings because that's exactly how I feel about open source. Um, I love this. I love that. <laughs> I love that so much. Um, uh, I, open source uh, is magic. Um, or at least it, it evokes the same feelings to me, for, for me that magic does. Um, every time I go to the console and I type in npm install, I take a moment to think about the fact that I've got over 100,000 things that I could install. And that's because of open source. Um, we are all building amazing things on the shoulders of other people. And frankly, they in turn are building their things on top of yet other people. Um, and this is, a, this is a remarkable world that we live in. Um, I'm not entirely sure everyone in the Node community is sufficiently appreciative or grateful of the remarkable ecosystem that we operate in, um, but I, I know I am. Uh, this past October, uh, a wonderful uh, woman by the name of Lena Reinhardt gave a talk on open source at JSConf EU. Um, it was about the future of open source. I, if you haven't seen this talk, go to the JSConf EU website. All the videos are posted. Um, feel free to watch it. I thought it was wonderful. Um, and you know, she reminded me that you know, virtually every transformative technology that we all take for granted, at least in the past 10 to 20 years, is built on top of open source. So, you know, open source really is magical. Um, so now I'm going to kind of take a, a left turn, and I'm going to get away from software, and I'm going to talk about community, and community in like the IRL sense, right? The in real life, like right here, like we're all in the same room. Um, I got my start in community uh, back in January of 2012. That's when I joined Twilio as a developer evangelist. 
Um, I had never been a developer evangelist before. I had really hadn't the foggiest notion what the job entailed. It sounded pretty cool. Um, so uh, I, I dove in. And uh, for me, uh, I discovered very rapidly um, that a massive component of my job was going to be to support my local developer community. Now, I don't know if I mentioned it, but I live in Seattle. Um, but uh, I had a lot of agency in defining what those words actually meant, like what was local. Like for me, local wasn't just Seattle. Like I wanted to make a difference in Seattle and other communities in the Pacific Northwest. So that includes obviously Portland, Oregon and Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, and like support, right? Like I don't, there are many, many ways you can support a community. Um, and I had to kind of decide for myself or figure out for myself what that was going to be. Um, and by the end of the year, me and some really remarkable people um, in that community put on a conference called Cascadia JS. And you saw some hands go up, um, and you've seen some pretty awesome hoodies around the room. Um, and uh, yeah, that, Cascadia JS is, uh, is a conference for web developers that takes place in the Pacific Northwest. And we put this on in November of 2012. And uh, it's just, I love looking at this photo um, because I have a lot of special memories um, that came out of this event. But also, I'd love to see the people, right? I mean, there's, there's Rick Waldron, um, you know, minus the beard. This is what he used to look like. Um, there's uh, Dominic Denicola looking actually exactly the same after three, <laughs> three years ago. Um, uh, oh, uh, wait, uh, there's uh, here's the guy that you didn't see today. There's Dominic Tarr, he's right there. <laughs> He's not here right now. He's, uh, I guess he got tear gassed or something. Uh, anyway, um, but you know, th th this event was special for me for a lot of reasons, um, but mostly because it made very tangible and real um, uh, my ability to make a difference in a community. Um, it took something that was abstract and, and, and made it real. But uh, the last couple of years, um, I've had this nagging question in my head, like why aren't more people doing this? Um, uh, and it's been it's very perplexing for me, right? Because you know I, I I get so much joy and pleasure and satisfaction out of contributing um, to the community and working on these things, but at the same time I go to all these events um, and I just see a lot of the same faces and a lot of the same people. It's almost like a click, and it's bizarre. I don't understand why more developers and more people aren't getting more involved in the community. Like the developer community just in, in general is growing, you know, at like an exponential rate, right? But I don't, I don't believe that the community of organizers is growing as fast. So this is very perplexing for me. Um, and I think it's actually like, it's not just perplexing, it's incredibly problematic. So uh, I did, uh, you know, what any person does who sort of cares about, you know, being data driven. Uh, I sent out a survey to a lot of developers um, that either I knew personally um, or whose work I respected. And uh, it was a very simple survey. It's like, you know, tell me about how involved you are in the community. Tell me some things that you like about being involved. Tell me some things that you don't like about being involved. I wanted, and I made sure, I didn't, I didn't send the survey to anybody who was an evangelist. I just wanted to talk to developers whose community activities are not their primary job. Um, and I got a lot of really interesting responses and I asked for permission to, to share some of them. So Justin Meyer, um, I think you can read this and you'll probably nod your heads, right? I mean, this is, this is something that's unfortunate about um, both online community and offline community. Um, but uh, it's, really, it's, really, it's really sad for me um, how many people r r repeated that kind of a comment because I feel like we've made a lot of progress. I think things are, there are, I thought, I thought there were fewer assholes out there, um, but maybe, I'm, maybe, there aren't, maybe there aren't fewer enough. Um, and uh, I think I myself have underestimated how, 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 how much of a barrier this can be for people wanting to get involved. Um, another comment which was actually really interesting for me um, was from Brenna O'Brien. Is she here? There she is. Um, this was really interesting for me um, because, because I don't consider myself to be an intimidating person and I don't consider the Cascadia Jazz community to be an intimidating community, but I have to deal with the fact that I don't, <laughs> I may not, be, I may clearly not have any idea like what is intimidating to other people, um, and this and this is this is uh, this is I'm really glad she shared this um, because I think it's entirely possible that despite my desire and my community's desire to be approachable, we're not working hard enough. Um, so it was really, really good to hear that. But there was still a problem that I, I couldn't figure out. Like, why did I feel so removed from this? So those barriers were like. In or you know, difficult to dispute, but nonetheless, like I myself had overcome them. Like I, I do all this stuff, 
Um, and uh, so why did I feel so personally removed from these problems that other people were voicing? And it's not because I'm special. I, I promise you, I'm the least special person here. Um, so, so, I, so I had a real, real sort of you know, uh, question about like why, you know, why, you know, why I was having such a different experience than others. So in order to answer that question, let's, let's take that a right turn right back into open source. And let's talk about uh, something called a community of practice. So this is something that came up in Lena's talk. Um, and uh, there's a wonderful ebook uh, called The Open Source Way that was written by the community architecture team at Red Hat. And they talk about um, communities of practice. So this was popularized by a theorist named uh, Etienne Weng Wenger. And uh, essentially, uh, community of practice, you, you can read what it is. But the people at Red Hat feel that op the open source way is just sort of an, an instance or an instantiation of this larger idea of a community of practice. And in fact, all professions are ultimately um, can be thought of as a community of practice, and the ideas and the com communities of practice are just a theory of social learning. So you can even go back to hunter gatherers, um, and you can talk about w how they learned to hunt and gather um, among each other as a community of practice. And the reason I bring this up to you is that if every profession is a community of pra or can be thought of as a community of practice, then my profession can be thought of as a community of practice, like evangelism, or advocacy, or de developer relations. I apologize for the word, it's kind of polarizing. Um, but I really thought back like, about what I've been doing over the last three years, and, if, and when I really took stock of what I've been doing, it's kind of remarkable. Um, I've probably been to over 100 events in the past three years. I've met some of the brightest and best event organizers in the world. Um, I've met some of the worst event organizers in the world. Um, I've seen what works, um, and I've seen what doesn't work. And I think I take for granted like how what the insane amount of learning that, uh, that I've experienced over this time. In addition, I'm not alone. I'm on a team of a dozen other evangelists at Twilio who are having the same kinds of experiences at the same pace. And our team has this culture of writing everything down. We write down everything and we share it amongst the team, either in the form of email or updating a wiki or, or what have you, right? There's this culture of learning and sharing. Um, and I, uh, and you know, it, just, it was sort of staggering to really think about it. Um, and you know, I don't know how many of you read Michael's blog post on creating a better node community, but this, this part really stuck out for me, right? Um, you know, because when you make it clear and obvious what people can do, they'll do it. Well, the inverse is that when you don't make it clear and you don't make it obvious, people won't do it. Like you are, when you don't write things down, you are creating either explicit or implicit barriers for people to contribute um, to your community. Um, which it's so obvious when you when you when you think about it, but you know it's shocking how resistant people are to writing things down. This comes up with codes of conduct. I can't tell you how many people have told me that they don't need a code of conduct because they're cool and their organizers are cool and everybody's cool and why do we have to write it down? Happens all the time, super frustrating. Um, so we have a lot of work to do and that's exactly what I want to do um, you know, with the spare time that I have um, moving forward. Like I wanna, you know, I'm not the best um, developer or engineer you know, in this room. Um, but I have, uh, I've learned a lot about community over the last few years, and I want to start writing it down. And that's what I mean by open sourcing community. Um, publishing the processes, procedures, and policies around community events. Uh, and this has already started to happen. I mean, I'm certainly not getting up here and, you know, pounding my fist about we need to start from scratch. Like, it's not true. Chris Williams, um, the founder of JSConf, you know, he wrote a blog post years ago, I think, about um, how to run a JS comp. So people have started to do this in, in bits and pieces, but I think we need to grossly accelerate the process. Um, for Cascadia JS, um, I started working um, on a document about how to run an event exactly like Cascadia JS. It's, you know, it's up on our GitHub repo. It's very incomplete. It needs so much more work, but um, it's an order of magnitude more detailed than Chris's blog post. I mean, it gets into like really you know, tough questions like finances and sponsors and speaker wrangling and stuff like that. Like this is just stuff that, this is stuff that, that is not written down anywhere because I had to learn it myself, usually through incredibly you know, long, tedious conversations, tedious uh, to, to other people, um, you know, like with people like Michael and Chris, you know, just sort of begging them to teach me. Um, but I think we need to document more of this stuff. Um, I was thrilled to discover Node School um, a few months ago. 
Um, and I can't believe how far they've come um, since sort of creating this concept. And I have to believe that part of the reason that it's grown as fast as it has is because should you go to the website and click on that little host button on the right, there is an incredibly thoughtful write-up on exactly how you can create a chapter, right? Like, not like tweet me at Max Ogden and I'll like, <laughs> we'll talk on the phone. Like, no, like Wait, here. I'm curious, can, uh, if you've ever helped do a node school, meaning you've either attended or you've helped host. Can you stand up? That's awesome. So you. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> um, and I, but I think, like once again, like it, uh, th there are other things that are that I think are actually just as cool as Node School, but uh, they they weren't as thoughtful about making it clear how people can participate, and because of that, they they have they they're niche and they haven't grown. So this is it's obvious, but not enough people do it, um, and I'm glad that that Node School is doing it. Um, and you know, the last thing, uh, and, and this is something I'm I'm sad about, um, like how to contribute, right? Like this is open source 101, right? Like if you have an open source project and you don't and you don't have a contributing dot markdown file, you know, shame on you, right? Like that is that's just so basic. Um, but I think I think events need something like this, and I'm not going to pretend to be super prescriptive or have the answers. Um, but I'm, we're starting to think about this for Cascadia JS, right? Like if you want to contribute to Cascadia JS, I don't want you to feel like you have to be friends with me or you have to have a relationship with me or one of the other organizers. Like there should be a a more transparent path to contributing to an event that is not my event, it, it's, it's the community's event. Um, so we've started to write some of these things down um, and you know, I, I hope to get feedback on what we're doing. Um, but I'll walk you through some of them. Um, the first thing is just be super explicit about setting expectations like in written form. Tell people clearly like what are the amazing things about contributing to a conference, but be honest about the things that are tough um, and aren't super great. Uh, be explicit about what you need help with. Um, this was taught to me by Alex Sexton. You know, he said, like, it, it is so stupid when, it, and this, is, this applies to all kinds of events, but it, like, if you run a meetup, if, if you just sort of put your, you put, send an email out and say, hey, I need help with the meetup, like, don't be surprised if nobody responds to you. Um, but if you do send an email out saying, I need help, and specifically, I need someone to help videotape the meetups. Like, you'd be amazed um, at the people who will be able to, who will think to themselves, oh, I know how to do that. I will now help. You have to be explicit about what you need help with. Um, facilitate conversation as much as possible. This is tough. Um, like, I literally just discovered Gitter <laughs> like a month ago. I'm kind of a late adopter. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's important. I think. Um, uh, more conversation and communication needs to be done in uh, places that are sort of publicly accessible so that maybe even before someone is sure whether or not they want to contribute to your event, they can kind of lurk and just sort of get a feel for what kind of community you are and what kind of people you are and what you care about. Um, Encourage people as much as possible to document and share their experiences. I was very uh, happy um, when I went to the Node School page that um, on that host page is a link of tons of write-ups um, from other organizers about their experiences, right? Um, people, sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that everything has to be canonical. Like, this is not true. Like, everyone has their own reasons for wanting to do a Node School or their, their own experiences doing it, and they're all different, right? And it's useful for someone thinking about getting involved to be able to read through all of those things and create a fuller picture of what's going on. Um, you know, and lastly, uh, you know, uh, a clear code of conduct. Um, code of conducts aren't just for events, at least I don't think they are. I think as we start to, as Cascadia JS starts to incorporate more people that we, do, that, I, that we don't have personal relationships with, I think we need to be super clear about like what kind of conduct is expected, um, not just at the conference, but you know, leading up to it. Uh, and the last story I want to share with you, um, so this is Doug McKenzie. He's a magician. Um, he did not teach me the magic trick I showed you. Figured it out all by myself. Um, but uh, he is a magician. Uh, I met him about a month ago. He's an incredibly thoughtful person. And he's also a developer. So he's like a magician slash developer. Um, he might be like literally the only one in the world. Um, but he's also an incredibly thoughtful guy. And I was talking to Doug um, about open source. Um, and he, he had this to share. Um, he... He believes, he, he knows that he couldn't have become a magician without the generosity um, of many other magicians kind of sharing them some tips and some tricks and some methods, right? Um, but in that community, um, there's also the realization that oftentimes, like, your secrets are your livelihood. They're how you earn a living. 
Um, so there's this tension between wanting to share more, but also wanting to, you know, to, to pay the mortgage. And I think that, you know, I think that I think in the in the community event space, there's a similar dynamic. There are event organizers, myself included, who feel like there's a little bit of magic in the experiences that we create. And there's a little bit of reticence um, you know, to share the secrets, because we feel that's, that's what makes our event magical. But, uh, but I think that we, have to, we all have to resist that urge and share as much as we possibly can, because you know, ultimately, um, you know, community is magic, right? Like, I could not have created Cascadia.js if not for the generosity of people like Michael and Chris Williams. Um, and you know, magical things happen at these events. Um, this is a picture of my daughter, Catherine, um, hanging out with Rebecca Murphy. And like, I don't know if she remembers this, that experience or not, but maybe she does. And maybe that's why she grows up to be a computer scientist someday. Like, I don't know, right? But I know that we need to enable more people and more kinds of people to create and contribute to community events because that's the only way that we can ensure that our, ensure that our community has a vibrant future, right? Not just for me and not just for you, but for the people who are coming later. Um, so I hope you all uh, will help me with this. Um, and uh, thank you for listening to my talk about open sourcing community.